My name is Dr. Kate. I became a doctor after experiencing the onset of severe health issues that puzzled doctors and left me without answers. I started television hosting in an effort to raise awareness about complex chronic illness and spread the information I've learned from niche health experts from all parts of medicine. In my interviews, you will find topics about heavy metals, environmental toxins, emotional causes of illness, struggle and triumph over adversity, silicone injury, hormones, peptides, regenerative medicine, and much more. I'm so grateful to have people come with me on this journey as I learn to heal my body and help others do the same. Dr. Cowden, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. So I want to just go over a little bit of your background for people who don't know. You are a retired medical doctor who's a holistic doctor. You are triple board certified in cardiology, intensive... Internal medicine. Internal medicine, intensive care cardiology, and nutrition and homeopathics, correct? Right. So you were just telling me off camera a little bit about your cardiology residency and how that went and would you mind yeah no that's fine uh al after i finished the uh, internal medicine residency in st louis i decided that i wanted to go beyond that in my education so uh, i wanted to be able to help the entire patient okay and critical care medicine accomplishes that but i couldn't see myself doing critical care medicine when i was 70 or 80 years old I thought, I thought I need to have another path that I can take if I need to at any point. And so that's why I went to the chief of internal medicine and said, I'd like to work out a conjoined critical care and cardiology fellowship training program. And he said, hmm, nobody's ever asked for that. I said, well, I'm asking. He said, well, I'll think about it. And so he thought about it and said, yeah, that'll work. And so I did uh, you know, three years of fellowship training instead of two years of cardiology only. And so I was able then to rotate through, uh, ne- you know, nephrology, you know, hemodialysis, uh, you know, the neurosurgery ICU, uh, the neurosurgical uh, treatment of patients, and also, uh, you know, a lot of other things that I wouldn't have been exposed to in, in cardiology alone. And so at, after I finished the training, I, I did critical care medicine and cardiology together for about a year. So allopathic training is very long and rigorous, as we know, and you did must have been over a decade of training allopathically before you decided to become a holistic physician, which you then went on to specialize in many things like Lyme disease, ALS. uh, I'm assuming you did natural cancer. I'm assuming asbestos, um, silicone illness, autism. Can you tell me a little bit about the transition into holistic medicine and then the additional training you did to become an expert? Yeah. Uh, When when I was growing up, I'd always lived in arid West Texas, and I got accepted to medical school in Houston. And I never lived any place where it was hot and humid. But uh, when I got there, I was not used to the grass and the weeds and the trees and the mold and the fungus and everything else that was in the air. So I developed allergic rhinitis, then allergic sinusitis, then bronchitis, then pneumonia. And I I was going to the chairman of of different medical school departments to get help. The, you know, allergy and immunology department first, the ear, nose, and throat department second, the pulmonary department third, and followed their advice, took the drugs that they recommended, got progressively worse. Thank goodness my wife's grandmother came to visit us. She was a school teacher and self-taught nutritionist. she, took, she had pity on me, took me to the health food store, got me on some vitamins, minerals, and herbs, and I got well in about a month. And I thought, my goodness, I need to learn what this woman knows. And so I started studying while I was in medical school all the integrated things that I learned over the next uh, eight years while I was going through the formal training. Can I ask you, during medical school, were you confronting any bias about holistic medicine, supplement, herbs from the traditional training, and how did you process these kind of conflicting concepts? Well, there was tremendous bias against uh, all the things natural in medical school, and so that's why I kept my mouth shut about what I knew, okay? And so uh, I figuratively didn't come out of the closet until 1985, yeah, uh, 1985. Uh, and uh, b- before that, I was, tr- you know, treating myself, my, my family, my, you know, close friends, but, but not patients. 
Okay. So, so ozone therapy is a huge part of your work and you've talked about it in many different situations, whether it's uh, pathogen infections in the absence of silicone or toxicity, you've talked about it in, in mercury poisoning. Well, at least Dr. Miller has, I'm assuming he learned about that through you. And we've, we've talked about ozone off camera and its ability to render silicone water soluble. Right. Would you like to tell me more about that? Yeah. Well, um, First thing that people need to know is that the FDA on their website says that uh, ozone is a toxic substance that should never be used therapeutically. However, in 1980, the German Medical Society published an article that showed that at that point, there had been 384,000 patients treated with 5.5 million ozone applications over the course of the previous 10 years. In, by the 8,000 plus doctors in Germany who were using ozone on a regular basis in their office. And the adverse event rate for those patients was 0. 0.000005. So that's the lowest adverse event rate that you'll find in any, you know, any medical treatment in the United States. Okay, but, but, but just know that if you're gonna use ozone that you have to give the patient appropriate informed consent saying, FDA says that ozone is a toxic substance and should not be used therapeutically. However, the research actually, to the contrary, shows it is beneficial. So that's, that's one thing. Yeah, now, uh, o ozone is, uh, is an antimicrobial. It ozone stimulates oxygen uh, uptake into the, into the tissues. That's a, another huge plus. Ozone does make o uh, silicone and certain other things uh, more water soluble. What so other things? Well, uh, you know, pesticides, okay. uh, herbicides, solvents, especially like benzene, xylene, toluene, uh, which are found in uh, the wall paints and uh, certain uh, adhesives and so on. So those are in the air of any fresh construction building. And so if you get those into your tissues, they, they get taken up by the fat cells of your body and they're trapped there for a period of time. But if you, if you do an ozone treatment, then a lot of those uh, fat soluble substances, benzene, xylene, toluene especially, will be oxidized and be converted into something that's water soluble so it can actually get into the, into the bloodstream and can be carried out of the body through the kidneys, urinary bladder, toilet, or liver, gallbladder, bowel, and toilet. And could you speak a little bit about heavy metals and ozone therapy? My understanding is it's excellent for that yeah, as well. the, Yeah, the ozone does seem to help uh, get the uh, he heavy metals out of the body as well. Uh, some of the heavy metals are, are fairly fat soluble. For example, um, methyl mercury is fat soluble. Ethyl mercury that's found in vaccines is fat soluble. Uh, but if you oxidize that, it becomes more water soluble and easier to get out of the body. So through the through the oxidation process, that's how it's changing these molecules. Yeah, oxygen is a, a single molecule of oxygen. Not a, not o oxygen that we breathe is O2. You know, so it's, so it's two, two oxygen molecules together, but with ozone, it, ozone is, is O3, and mm -hmm. it, it uh, is able to give one, you know, some of its electrons or some of its oxygen to other molecules. So by that logic, would you see a similar result from high-dose vitamin C once it switches into a more oxidative capability? Well, yeah, high-dose high intravenous vitamin C uh, actually causes a hydrogen peroxide burst in the body. And that's probably as a result of release of hydrogen peroxide from white blood cells. Uh, white blood cells uh, digest whatever they ingest by, you know, releasing uh, hydrogen peroxide from lysosomes and, and peroxisomes and in, into the uh, granules that have taken up the bacteria, virus, fungus, whatever, from the, from the environment around the white blood cell. So without that uh, oxidative process inside the white blood cells, the, mi the microbes just continue to live and divide and multiply inside the cell. So we've used it traditionally in, in cancer, in alternative cancer, in an in infection, high dose C, and I, I had not known very much about it for heavy metals and toxicity. So I was just wondering if it's similar to ozone in that regard. Yeah, well, you know, the uh, ozone is an extremely valuable tool for lots of different conditions. You know, I've used it in patients that were sent home to die okay. and have had, had good success. You know, I had, had a patient uh, about 1990 who had uh, a large vegetation on her mitral valve. 
and uh, she had been in the hospital for 14 days, I think, at that point. Uh, and they tried all kinds of drugs, and nothing made a dent in the vegetation on her mitral valve. Uh, so she, they said, uh, go home. Uh, when you get profoundly, severely short of breath, feel like you're going to die, come back and we'll try to do a heart, a heart valve replacement. And she told me that. I said, really? They said that? She said, yeah. I said, well, why don't we give you a little bit of uh, either hydrogen peroxide therapy or ozone therapy to see if we can make a difference? So uh, she, I told her about both, and she said, I think I feel more comfortable with the hydrogen peroxide therapy. I said, okay. So she get intravenous hydrogen peroxide, did that once daily, put one catheter in that remained for five days. We did it once daily, uh, intravenous hydrogen peroxide for five days. On the fifth day, we did an echocardiogram. The vegetation was gone. And when you say vegetation, you're talking about a pathogen colonizing well, a valve. In her case, it was a fungus that was growing on her on her heart, on her heart valve. Does that present as like a pericarditis, or how was she? What kind of symptoms? Was she, how did they diagnose that? Well, uh, she she had shortness of breath. She had uh, a little TIA, transient ischemic attack, a little light stroke. Mm -hmm. Uh, on her fingers, she had uh, splinter hemorrhages, so that looks like little splinters driven in under your nails on several of her fingers and several of her toes, and that's a that's a pathological sign of uh, you know endocarditis or you know, vegetation on the heart valve, and so she she knew that there was something wrong when she started seeing all these things and had the TIA, transient ischemic attack, light stroke. So she went to the hospital and they did the echocardiogram and saw the vegetation and started treatment. Wow, it was visible on imaging. That is amazing. Wow. Well, all right. I'm glad you brought up the heart because I do have more questions related to toxicity and the autonomic nervous system. And I would like to get into laser detox. And then we're going to loop it back to getting silicone out of the lymph, like your patient and that you that you made laser detox for. So yeah, wherever uh, you want to go with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, over the years, I've treated a lot of patients with advanced heart disease, uh, including cardiomyopathy and advanced congestive heart failure. And uh, so I learned about 20 years ago how to reverse that without you know, pharmaceutical drugs or uh, open, you know, open heart surgery, heart transplant and all that. And uh, so, you know, one, one of the key factors is to get rid of the broken hardness that almost all of them have. And uh, so the broken hardness apparently causes physical toxin accumulation. Hold on, hold on. You're talking about heartbreak, like the emotional... The emotional broken hardness okay. causes physical toxin accumulation in the heart muscle. And I, I proved that actually with one patient, uh, years ago, just out of curiosity, a patient that had a cardiomyopathy, and uh, yeah, we uh, did a 24-hour urine collection for, for heavy metals, and then I did an emotional conflict resolution session with the patient, and then we did another 24-hour collection for heavy metals, and there was massive amounts of mercury and lead and other metals that came out into the urine after we did the emotional conflict resolution process. Okay, and the patient's congestive heart failure, cardiomyopathy went away. So in laser detox, which is a program that you invented, you are targeting nerve ganglion and you're targeting them using a laser that has an imprint of toxins, correct? And I've gone through that process several times and I have other I know other people who have and your and your mentee who who performs it and, and there's this consensus that there's always an emotional release that occurs simultaneously when you go after these nerve ganglion where talk, you know, you just yeah. using a toxin. So what you're describing now is the opposite process where you use an emotional therapy and then that causes the release of toxins. So I'd love for you to elaborate on both sides of that. Well, yeah, you can go at it either from either direction. Some patients say, I don't have any emotions. That's mostly the macho men. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't have any emotions. So, okay, we'll just do something else then. We'll do laser detox. And, uh, and when we do the laser detox, we always add flowers and colors to the little vial that we use to, to do the laser detox. And they start getting emotion release just because we added the flowers and colors to their laser detox. Uh, we didn't tell them we were gonna do that. They just, we just did that because it's necessary to do that to get the emotion, to get the physical toxins to release from the tissues. If you don't do enough on the emotional side, the toxins don't release easily. But uh, yeah. I, uh, I co-developed the laser detox process in 2001 with uh, a, a PhD quantum physicist from uh, Surrey, England, and a PhD 
anatomist, microanatomist from uh, University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in, in uh, Dallas. And uh, I, uh, I saw that the microanatomist microanatomy professor was uh, doing treatment on really gravely ill patients and he's probably going to kill somebody if I didn't intervene. So I uh, helped him work out uh, the method of doing it safely. So I think the concept of storing emotions in the body is something that we we all kind of have, uh, we're all aware of, especially in in somatic therapy and whatnot. But what I, what I find fascinating about laser detox is you're providing a pretty an anatomical scientific approach to the concept of the nervous system storing heavy metals, chemicals, and toxins during a time of trauma. And my understanding is that it's imprinted in the ganglion and you're somehow interfacing with that. Can you elaborate? Well, yeah, the toxins are actually in every tissue of the body. Sometimes they're more concentrated in the ganglia of the nervous system than other places. Uh, and sometimes you have to do you know, additional uh, infrared therapy on the ganglia specifically or on the toxic foci that the Germans described uh, to, before you try to do the, the laser sweep in order to be able to get all the toxins out. If you don't do the, the treatment of the ganglia and the, and the uh, toxic foci with the infrared light first, then, then usually you have to do more than one laser detox. But if you do the, all the, you know, get all the toxins out of the toxic foci and the ganglia first with the infrared light, then oftentimes one laser detox is enough for a lifetime. So the idea is that these nerve ganglion are kind of like hubs where nerves synapse and send signals to all the tissues, right? And yeah. you're saying that if those areas are toxic, it has a cascade effect on the rest of the tissue, which is also storing toxins. So starting there is kind of having a like a ripple effect. Is that accurate? Yeah. Uh, I, I think that the, uh, the, the toxins... Uh, are released from tissues because of the effect that the laser detox has on the nervous system that goes to every cell of the body. We have autonomic nerves that go to every cell of our body via the, uh, you know, they, they, they piggyback along the uh, capillary system, along the arteries and the, and the veins and the capillaries. And so when the, when the, uh, when you do an emotional release, I believe that you're releasing the cellular memory from those uh, autonomic nervous system terminals, you know, the very end branches where, where they're embedded into organs. You know, the Chinese figured out about 2,000, 3,000 years ago that, uh, that the emotion of anger gets trapped in the liver and the gallbladder and the bile ducts, and that the emotion of uh, fear gets trapped in the kidneys and urinary bladder and uh, adrenal glands. And if you, if you, uh, say, well, it's in the hepatocytes? Mm, probably not. It's probably in the autonomic nerves that go to the mm -hmm. hepatocytes. Okay. But, uh, you know, it's, it's semantics, really. It is and it isn't. But then you would you would imagine that in someone with, with liver congestion from toxicity that they also have toxic bile, like physically toxic bile and physically toxic liver, right? Yeah. 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 So it's both. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, the, the, the emotional toxins very often precede the physical toxin accumulation. And uh, a lot of uh, doctors treat only the, um, the physical side because that's what they were trained, that's all they know, mm -hmm. and they don't do anything about the emotional parts of the, of the equation. But you know, I found a long time ago that if you will address the emotional side, you'll get faster and better results. You know, there's a hierarchy of healing that I found. You know, the, the, the highest level of hierarchy is the spiritual level. But mo a lot of people are not willing to go there because they, they don't believe in God. They don't believe in any, any, any higher power than themselves. Uh, so you can't go there with those patients. Uh, you, uh, some of them even, won't, as I said, won't, won't uh, uh, acknowledge that emotions have an impact on their physical health. So they won't go there either. So you have to go further down the chain. You go to quantum physical next. That would be like the laser detox. And, uh, and then if they won't go there, then you go, go to the physical, all the way down to the physical, you know, which can be herbals or pharmaceuticals or uh, you know, ozone or you know, other things. Well, there's certainly a lot of scientific evidence today on meditation and you know, mind, mindfulness practices, um, practices that quiet the mind and the body. And in a sense, it's similar to prayer and um, meditating. And 
my question is that, you know, I personally experience these issues and I've seen a lot of patients with these issues that end up very sick with complex chronic illness. Typically, they have a hypervigilance in their personality that can be traced all the way back to utero, potentially with a mother with with mercury amalgams or some other, you know, central nervous system agonist. And it just very much becomes a problem when they seem to be wired a certain way. And you try to introduce these techniques and it can have very little effect on the autonomic dysregulation. And I was hoping you could enlighten me about how, what to do with somebody like that. Yeah, well, uh, uh, yeah, I have found that the most significant emotions that a person carries that affects their physical health are emotions that they picked up from their parents while they were in the womb, okay? Uh, so, and the emotions that they picked up from the parents might not have originated from their parents. It might have originated from their grandparents or their great-grandparents or their great-great-grandparents. Much like the mercury yeah, that came. The, 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 <laughs> the, the, an evidence of that is that uh, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors have uh, autonomic nervous system dysregulation proven by heart rate variability that is out of proportion to other people in the population that have not been in that lineage of, uh, of survivors of the Holocaust. So, you know, the, the, the child, the person you're talking about wasn't in the Holocaust. Right. The parent wasn't in the Holocaust, but the grandparent was in the Holocaust, okay? And uh, so it, it, it goes back at least two generations that we improve scientifically. Okay. Okay. How do you improve heart rate variability in somebody? Yeah, so there's tools out there that will get at some of that. Uh, I, one of my favorite tools is uh, Evox. Uh, Evox is a uh, is a software created by the Zyto Corporation out of Salt Lake City, Utah, and the the Evox software goes onto a PC, and you you have a headset on with earphones and microphone. And you're instructed to close your eyes, visualize a person or an event. And while you're visualizing that person or event, you just speak a, a word or a group of words repetitively uh, for a few seconds. And then after some seconds, you have displayed on the computer screen all the emotions and all the beliefs that are attached to that person or that event with about a 95% predictive accuracy as, as far as I can tell. And then the machine takes your own voice frequencies and makes it into a homeopathic home accord that it delivers back to the patient through a hand electrode while they're listening to pleasant instrumental music. And so uh, what patients say that have gone through that, they feel like they come out of the session lighter than when they went in. They don't know how to explain that, but they just say, I feel lighter. We had a, uh, a psychologist uh, years ago who came for an evaluation and the naturopathic doctor that I was working with and I both felt that this was mostly emotions. Mm -hmm. And so we said, we, we think you should do an Evox. And she said, is that that voice thing I read about in the waiting room? Yeah. I said, well, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's gonna do any good because I have my own psychologist. I go spend an hour per, per week, mm -hmm. uh, every week, with my psychologist laying on the couch. And I've done that every, every week for the last 10 years. I don't think I could have any emotions having affected my health. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, would you humor us and just do one session? She said, oh yeah, I'll humor you. So she went into the Evox room expecting nothing, okay? And came out of the Evox room about an hour later while I was in the hallway. And uh, she said, I can't believe what just happened in there. She said, I released more emotions in the last hour than I've released from the last, in the last 10 years on the couch. I said, are you sure it wasn't a placebo effect? I was kind of poking fun at yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've, I'm in favor of the placebo effect and if it's involved. But yeah, you're talking about, you know, well, it reminds me of the biology of belief, the work of, you know, Dr. Lipton and... Yeah, yeah, Candace Perth did some great work on that and uh, you know, others have as well, but... Uh, but I guess my question is, you know, in lieu of doing these emotional therapies, these mind over matter therapies or, or hijacking that pathway in some way, if you're doing physical training of the heart and you're trying to, I mean, you're a trained cardiologist, I just would love your opinion. There's this like thin line between heart stress and then, you know, productive heart training, right? And when you're looking at a toxicity patient who has severe autonomic dysregulation, potentially you could look at a Lyme patient with heart involvement. Etc. How do you like? How do you manage that type of scenario? Like, well, yeah. Some some people have cardiac arrhythmias because of uh, uh, physical toxins trapped in the stellate ganglia, uh, which is right down here at the base of the neck, uh, right above the collarbones. 
uh, are in the cardiac ganglia on either side of the heart, uh, are in uh, the vagus ganglia, back about here, right under the earlobe. So in the old days, um, I, before I was doing more of the emotional work, I would, uh, I would do German neural therapy, put some procaine in, uh, into that uh, location and, and see a, 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 an improvement of the arrhythmia. But what I noticed is that very often, after some days or weeks, the pr problem would recur because I hadn't addressed the root emotion that was behind the accumulation of toxins in that particular ganglia. So I'd have to reshoot them. <laughs> okay, all right. So we're looking at a very complicated approach to healing in these situations, but... Yeah, but uh, you know, people that have uh, valvular heart disease very often have e e um, emotional hard-heartedness. Hard-heartedness is the extreme of anger. Okay. okay, so you start out with frustration, then you go to anger, then you go to bitterness, resentment, rage, finally end up with hard-heartedness. Uh, and if you don't resolve the hard-heartedness, then you're going to develop valvular heart trouble, in my experience. And uh, But if you can resolve the hard-heartedness, resolve the anger, uh, the, the hard-heartedness starts improving gradually. So you mentioned neural therapy with procaine injections. We were talking earlier off camera about that in relationship to scars in plastic surgery patients. So I'd love to mm -hmm. you to talk more about that, and then we'll loop back to lymph and breast implant patients. Yeah. Well, when when you when you create a scar, whether it's by an incision by a, by a surgeon or by a laceration, an accidental event, uh, you end up getting a, a, a scar usually across an acupuncture meridian. So if the, if the scar uh, is blocking the energy flow through an acupuncture meridian, then the energy that needs to go to an organ can't get there, okay? And so you get a back pressure on this side of the scar and you get a deficiency of energy on that side of the scar. And you know, by the way, there's lots and lots of literature absolutely proving the presence of acupuncture meridians. Hmm. Uh, you know, one of the people that helped helped uh, co-develop the uh, laser detox was doing the microanatomy of the acupuncture meridians and acupuncture points, and found that that there was five times more uh, autonomic terminals on uh, close to the skin surface at an acupuncture point than the point just one quarter inch away. Okay, so that's an anatomical proof of mm -hmm. acupuncture points. Mm -hmm. Doctor Vol proved acupuncture points with uh, a, a ohm meter, uh, and he did that over the course of 30 years. He, he verified that all 350 acupuncture points that the Chinese told us about were exactly where they said they were, not a quarter inch away from where they said they were, and, uh, and so on. Uh, the, the, the French uh, did, uh, neuro, did uh, injection of nuclear reactive materials into the acupuncture points and traced the acupuncture to trace those, those nuclear materials up the acupuncture meridian, not up the venous system, not up the lymphatic system, but up the wow. acupuncture meridian system. So anyway, that, that's, anyway back, back to the scars. If you, if you have a, a scar blocking energy flow through a, through a meridian, there's a lot of different ways to try to deal with that. If it's a, if it's a, a mild scar, a shallow scar, sometimes you can apply clay mud and some homeopathic type of energies to the clay mud and it'll pull the toxins out of the scar and allow the energy to start flowing through the scar. If it's a more dense scar, uh, then oftentimes you have to break up the scar. And the way that I do that is put procaine, preservative free procaine without anything else in it into a syringe and then take a 27 gauge needle usually, an inch and a half long, and tunnel it under the scar for, for the full length of the needle and then inject as I'm pulling back out. And so basically it separates the scar. And so, so somewhere in that separation, the energy flow, can flow through the acupuncture meridian that, that's been blocked. So earlier when you were talking about that in relationship to breast implant illness patients, were you speaking about the explant scars? Is that where you were? Explant scars okay. or maybe the residual of the implant scar, who knows? So we also, on the topic of people who are bad candidates for breast implants, I, I told you earlier about a really popular current procedure called BBL, which is a really elaborate move, moving of fat from one area to the body to like maybe the butt or another area. It, it's become very popular. And my concern is that I see a lot of women who have that procedure along with a silicone implant somewhere in the body. 
I'd like you to speak on the potential impact of scarring on the lymphatics from liposuction and how that would affect. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're, 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 you're messing up the body's uh, innate uh, natural design in a major way by, by putting a scar anywhere on the body. Uh, you know, it's one thing to get an accidental scar from a laceration, but it's another thing to have an intentional scar mm. created for cosmetic reasons. Okay, and uh, you know, you're, you're, if, if the organs don't get enough energy flow through the acupuncture meridians, they gradually degenerate. So you die prematurely because you block the energy flow through your acupuncture meridians. And that happens not just with scars, but also wearing metal jewelry mm -hmm. all the time. You know, so, some women wear ne metal necklaces 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. and they're blocking energy flow through the acupuncture meridians as a result of that. So what about what you said earlier about the scarring from liposuction having an impact on lymphatics in the region? Yeah, yeah it does have a huge impact on the, on the lymphatics. A lot of the lymphatics are shallow lymphatics, and uh, you usually work on those with dry skin brushing or with man you know, light touch manual lymphatic massage. Uh, and if, you're, if your shallow lymphatics get clogged, then all the lymph has to go back to your central circulation through the deep, deep lymphatics but you're still creating a, a, a local problem because the toxins can't drain away from those tissues that are being blocked by the, uh, by the scar. So I could see a problem if those women start mobilizing microsilicone into the lymph and then it circles back to what you mentioned earlier, that being a more difficult situation. So, all right, well, I want to wrap this up by going back and talking about what you did with the Hollywood movie star in the 90s, what you created, which addressed internal lymphatics and the gall, is that correct? It was. Yeah, yeah, so the cisterna chile is the part of the lymphatic system that dumps into the bowel lumen, okay? So if you have lymphatic fluid coming from your lower extremities, uh, up through your thighs, up through your pelvis, into the abdominal cavity, uh, you can either continue moving up the pathway all the way to the uh, pl place where the lymphatics dump into the superior vena cava up here below the collarbones, or you can take, give it a, a side route, you know, so that it goes to the lumen of the bowel and dumps the toxins into the bowel. And so when we did the silicon detox process, uh, we, what we saw was um, patients about the third day seeing white fluffy stuff coming out of the toilet every time they sat on the toilet uh, from, from uh, the, the, the four gallon ozonated colima. And uh, uh, you know when we scooped that up and sent it off to the lab, they said it's indistinguishable from silicone. I said, well, it's because it's silicone. <laughs> uh, when we, when we uh, did the ozonated foot uh, body soaks, you know, putting a patient in a bath with an ozone bubbler, bubbling ozone into the water, about the fourth, third or fourth day, we would see the white fluffy stuff coming out of the bath water. And we scooped that up and sent it off to the lab and it, they said it's indistinguishable from silicone. I said, okay, that's, that's because it's silicone. And uh, so, we, you know, you can, get, you can get silicone out of the body by various routes, but the best way, in my opinion, is through the bowel and through the skin, not, not up here to the, to the you know, superior vena cave and then get pumped through the, uh, by the heart through the, you know, kidneys into the urinary bladder uh, it, because that oftentimes will cause undue stress on the kidneys. And, or if you send it through the liver, even greater distress on the liver because the liver has to figure out how to get it out. Would, would ozone and like blood hemo ozone be like a liver route way? Or, I mean, is that making the ozone, uh, making the silicone water soluble, is that going to be liver kidney route? Is that what you're describing? Yeah, it does help some of it go out through the kidney. And, and a lot of patients noticed that, there, that the urine became cloudy mm. about the third, third or fourth day. Uh, so it's coming out by various routes. So I know a little bit about this process, but I've never done it. And my understanding is that you're using sort of an ozone colonic with a certain type of pressure system that you developed that allows the gallt to release into the bowel with whatever it's holding. Is that accurate? Yeah. Well, you know, with a, with a colonic, uh, that's, for most patients, a fairly passive process. Mm -hmm. And uh, with a colemic, uh, it's a gravity-fed, not a pressure-fed, okay. uh, you know, uh, fluid mm -hmm. into the bowel. And it's ozonated, uh, which also most colonics are not ozonated. And then, in addition, it's, uh, 
it, it, it's not a passive process. You're with a colima, you're actually uh, holding the ileocecal valve closed, which uh, connects the small and large intestine together uh, at the right point during the process of filling your bowel with the ozonated fluid. And uh, other times during that process, you open up the ile ileocecal valve so that stuff from the small intestine can go on into the large intestine and be evacuated into the toilet. Uh, in, in addition to holding the ileocecal valve closed, you need to be massaging the sigmoid colon, the, ascend, the descending colon, the splenic flexure, the transverse colon, the hepatic flexure, uh, and the ascending colon. Uh, and if you don't massage all of that, the, the stuff that's in the bowel doesn't go on into the toilet. But mm -hmm. if you do, do the massage of the entire colon, then it goes on into the toilet like it's supposed to. So, so it's not a passive process at all. The patient's very active during the, the colemas. Wow, yeah, and I've heard it's a lot of work, but it has uh, excellent results, and not just for silicone illness, for other, for many types of illnesses. Yeah, yeah, we've seen uh, uh, patients get uh, asbestos out of the body with the uh, rapid cleanse as well. Uh, I had a fellow that uh, that had uh, mesothelioma, and uh, it, it was because of, of asbestos that he had accumulated. I think he was in the Navy, if I'm not mistaken, but anyway, had a big, a, a boatload of, asbestos in his body and so I said I've seen that asbestos come out once before in a patient that has silicone and asbestos so why don't you try that and so he started doing the uh, the seven day rapid cleanses he did a week on and two weeks off and a week on and two weeks off and uh, about the third third day of the of the uh, first cleanse he started getting these sharp spicules coming out of his skin and he would take tweezers and pull them out of his skin and put them into a cup and in the first cleanse, he had about a third to a half a cup full of, uh, you know, spicules coming out of him. And uh, in the next cleanse, more spicules. In the next cleanse, more spicules. Eventually, he got out a whole cup full. And, uh, and then they stopped coming out. And after that, he went back for a repeat uh, evaluation of his uh, mesothelium. It was gone. Wow. Amazing. And you never tested it, the stuff that came out? No. Didn't test the, yeah. the, the asbestos on him. Uh, that would have been interesting to do, yeah. but uh, it was going to cost him a pretty pile of money. He said, I, I yeah. don't want to spend the money on that. I said, okay, I understand. Wow. Well, this this has all been extremely useful and fascinating information. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything else you want to add that I didn't ask you before we finish. Well, I think, uh, as I said at one point during the presentation uh, or, or the, the uh, interview, is that the, the hierarchy – Again, a spiritual first, okay. emotional second, and quantum physical next, and then physical last. And most allopathic doctors work only on the physical. And so if you want to be, have greater success, shorter, shorter treatment, less expensive treatment, then you need to work your way up that, that ladder. You know, if you can get to the point where you, where you believe in God and believe in you know, the, the creative order and uh, the, the fact that God created the human body and, and nature, then work on that level and you'll get there fastest. So you have pioneered several really interesting techniques, which we're going to get into later, like laser detox and also uh, your Cowden retreat, which I think I, changed, I butchered the name of it. But that came about after you worked with a silicone patient, which is a great story. I was wondering if you could tell me about your very first silicone toxicity patient. So that was uh, a Hollywood movie star that called me, uh, and my my uh, receptionist recognized that it was a Hollywood movie star. She said, I think you're supposed to talk to this one. So I talked to her, and, and she said, uh, I, I was told by our mutual friend, Burton Goldberg, that if anybody in the country could help me, it would be you. And I said, well, what's your problem? She said, I, uh, I had silicone breast implants put in and got gravely ill, had the breast implants removed, and I'm still gravely ill. And I'm fully disabled. I can't remember my acting lines. I, I have such excruciating pain and fatigue that I can't function, and I need some help. I said, well, I've not dealt with that before, but uh, come to Texas and we'll do what we can do. So what was your initial instinctual thought when you heard about breast implants and her symptoms? Like what came to mind for you? I knew that probably, uh, since it's a foreign material, that some of that foreign material was not still in her chest, but elsewhere in her body. And so when I 
saw her for the first time. Indeed, when I palpated lymph nodes throughout her body, they were all not normal. Okay, it was obvious that there was you know, silicone in those lymph nodes, in her axilla, in her chest wall, in her neck, in various other places in her body. And uh, I pre you know, s supposed that she also had microscopic silicone in lots of other places in her body that I couldn't palpate. And so I thought, well, we're going to have to find a way to get silicone out. And so that's why we uh, put her into a hotel a, a few a few blocks from the office, and uh, I sent my best nurse over there two hours, twice a day, every day, to hold her hand to help her go through the detox process that I developed. Okay, and we're going to get into the details of what that is, but I just want to set the stage with this patient. So when she came to you, she was already aware that silicone was the problem. She was aware that her symptoms were silicone related. Can you talk about how she knew that and kind of what was going on in the 90s? Well, she had had a, um, a blood test that showed she had an autoimmune reaction against silicone, so, so that there was no doubt that, at least immunologically, her body was rejecting the silicone. Uh, but the silicone chunks were out of her chest wall, but you know she was still reacting, so it was obvious that she still had microscopic silicone throughout her body. So she had already undergone the explant procedure, but she was still struggling to detox microsilicone, and she had an autoimmune disease. Correct. So like part of the issue we see today is that the silicone is a lot less migratory to the eye. It's part of the reformulation when they were put back on the market was they were made to be more cohesive, probably with the in induction of even more chemicals to aid into the cohesiveness. But we still see lots of problems with gel bleed and microsilicone, and many of these women don't have autoimmune diseases, but they're still very sick and they present similarly. Could you speak on that? Well, yeah, a, a lot of them don't have classic autoimmune disease. Uh, you know, the, the research that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, uh, I know it's been 20 years ago now, uh, showed that, uh, that when they analyzed the hospital charts of women that came in with silicone implants uh, less than nine years duration, uh, that, that they had atypical symptoms, and they, they were, none of them had classical autoimmune symptoms or none of them have classical autoimmune laboratory findings. Um, but that didn't make them any less sick. They were still very gravely ill, a lot of them. So, so you're saying that in the study they were looking for the hallmarks of very specific diseases that have specific hallmarks. So if they had an autoimmune process that didn't cookie cutter fit into an exact disease, then it was marked as that they didn't have it when really they had antibodies against tissue. Yeah. Correct? Yeah, and, and, that, and that study was actually funded by, by Dow Chemical Company and you know they they designed the the research protocol and handed it to you know the two Ivy League uh, hospitals that actually did the data collection process. So it's a, like a lot of the research that's in the literature. It's 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 uh, you, f you get the result that you want to get. Right. So we went on. You went on to do about thirty other women with silicone illness through your retreat process. And did every one of those women have an autoimmune process? Uh, no, uh, not not by conventional laboratory testing. Some of them did, but, but some of them did not. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the other ways t the toxins can induce symptoms that don't have to do with immune dysregulation. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, uh, that I'm very convinced that happens is that uh, white blood cells uh, engulf little pieces of silicone, go, basically go up to a silicone bag, even if it's a saline implant, they go up to the silicone bag and pinch off a little piece and travel <clears throat> elsewhere in the body, usually through the lymphatic system initially. And some of, them, some of them end up dying, some of the white cells end up dying in the lymphatic system. When a white cell dies, whatever's in the, in the white cell gets deposited in that new location. You know, white cells don't have any kind of enzymatic machinery to break down silicone. So whatever they, whatever they engulf is just in them until they die, okay? so. The patients that I saw, saw in those days, all of them had severely clogged up lymphatic system. And you know, when you clog up your lymphatic system, several things happen. You, you get a, a, a backlog of toxins in the tissues. The, the lymphatic system is supposed to carry toxins away from the tissues and carry them to the central circulation so they can be pumped through the you know, kidneys, urinary bladder, toilet, or liver, gallbladder, bowel, and toilet so that those toxins can be eliminated from the system. 
but they weren't being eliminated. They were just piling up in the tissue. So it sounds like they're probably having a combination of clogged lymphatics from the deposited silicone from the dying macrophages and then, and then potentially the problem of the macrophages in general becoming a little bit less potent because they're confused by the foreign body. Is that accurate? That, that's a part of it. And then, you know, because other toxins can't exit the tissues, you know, like heavy metals and pesticides and herbicides and all that other stuff, they back up into the cells and the cells become sick. The enzymatic machinery inside the cells shuts down. The patients go from aerobic metabolism into anaerobic metabolism. They start producing lactic acid. Lactic acid further poisons the tissues. So a vicious cycle gets going. Okay, and, and then that would present, present as what type of symptoms? Well, it can show up in different, different people in different ways, but uh, in, if it's, if it's uh, poisoning of the brain, you're gonna get you know, memory loss, uh, difficulty with focus, concentration, uh, sometimes even uh, labeled neurological diseases, you know, like Parkinson's or MS or one of those other labeled diseases. Uh, if, it's in the, uh, if it's in the liver, uh, the liver gets to where it can't metabolize the toxins that are, that are entering the body every day from food and water and air. And so those toxins pile up in the, in the liver to the point where the liver is completely overloaded. Then the toxins start spilling out into the bloodstream and go to the kidneys and poison overload the kidneys and then poison overload the lungs and the heart and the other vital organs. Thank you for explaining that. So a big portion of my work is around the idea that there are pre there's pre-existing states of the body that make someone very a very bad candidate for breast implants. And certainly I have personally seen many people that are healthy with breast implants. Um, they seem to have a very good collagen system and a very good scar tissue capsule around the breast implant. So I'd like to talk a little bit now about scar tissue in general and, and healthy patients and also people who definitely should not get breast implants. Yeah, I think that uh, actually probably the majority of women uh, if they keep breast implants long enough, will develop problems. Uh, what's long enough? Maybe for one, one woman it might be one year, for another woman it might be 10 years, for another woman it might be 20 years. I don't know what, the, what it's gonna be for any one person because we're all biochemically and genetically different. Uh, but uh, I just have found that, the, that it's not a good idea to put foreign bodies of any type into the body, whether it's a titanium implant into your jaw or a artificial joint. You know, uh, you know, if you, if you look at uh, most of these things that are put into the body with your naked eyes, they look smooth, okay? But if you look at them under a microscope, they have little holes in them, little pits. And those pits are oftentimes small enough or large enough for bacteria to get inside of, but, but small enough to where white blood cells can't get down inside those holes. So those microbes get down inside those holes, divide, multiply, produce biotoxins, poison the immune system, poison the, the enzymatic machinery of the cells, and pretty soon you've got a problem because you have a foreign, foreign body in the body. So you're talking about an inflammatory process as ground zero around any device inside the body, and then we have various trajectories to, to the way a bio-individual system handles that, whether it's becoming autoimmune or, or having some sort of epigenetic switch flipped to turn on some other disease. Right. Yeah, so we, we have people going through life uh, gathering up toxins. The analogy I make is uh, every human being is like a camel walking down the path of life and workers on either side of the path are bowling up bundles of straw, throwing them onto the camel's back, and somewhere along the path, the camel comes crashing to his or her knees if they're out of the hospital, crashing to their belly if they're in the hospital. And that person, that's that camel, thinks that they can just take off the last bundle and get up and walk again. It doesn't happen. You have to unload almost the entire load. So potentially a person who has moderately good health or they don't really think that they're in too bad of shape, they're not experiencing any disease processes or major symptoms, but they could have low-grade toxins, um, allergens, uh, things like, you know, maybe things of that nature, and then they put the implants in their body, and then they're going to struggle more than someone else. Is that accurate? Yeah. I mean, if you were born in the mountains in Tibet and you've lived there all your life, then you don't have a lot of toxins probably. But if you lived almost any, in any big city of the, of the planet, you're loaded up with toxins. Uh, we're we're got all getting exposed to them every day, you know, air, food, and water. 
Okay, so we see a lot of co-problems in silicone toxicity patients. Like we see a lot of parasitic infections, other types of of infections. Uh, we see uh, we see problems related. Yeah, we see we see problems related to collagen, to aging, to skin laxity. We see a lot of histamine issues. Could you talk a little bit about those relationships? Yeah. Uh- you know, Dr. Antoine Beauchamp was a contemporary of Louis Pasteur, uh, who lived back in the 1800s, and he said the environment is everything. He was talking about the internal environment of the body. So as we go through life, we're accumulating stuff in our environment, and that stuff uh, weakens the immune system, makes it harder for white blood cells to work uh, properly, uh, creates uh, you know metabolic derangements because of messing up the enzymes of the of the cells and so on, and so at some point that person becomes very susceptible to viral infections, bacterial infections, fungal infections, protozoal parasites. Uh, can't even can't even defend against the worm parasites uh, when you get uh, loaded up enough, and so all of those things are additional loads on the body, additional bundles on the camel's back figuratively. So my thesis around my thesis is that people who have a, you know a lot of those problems prior to getting breast implants they struggle to make high quality collagen around the breast implant which you know speed speeds the process of the immune system mobilizing microsilicone and I've seen this a lot I've seen a lot of people with very thin capsule tissue after explant or sometimes they have the opposite which is the very severe capsular contracture which I believe is fruit of the same poison tree of collagen derangement yeah. Yeah, so, so when, sometimes, uh, sometimes women that, are, that have breast implants removed get sicker after mm-hmm. the implant comes out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the things that's happening, I think, is that uh, the immune system was so burdened by those foreign bodies in the body mm-hmm. uh, that it couldn't even function properly. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden, you take some of the load down, and the immune system says, oh, my goodness, where did all this stuff come from? What, what, what's been going on here? So the immune system wakes up and starts attacking whatever it can. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the, the symptoms that people have are usually related to white blood cells producing cytokines, cytokines then uh, either dilating blood vessels and causing inflammation, uh, you know, causing, uh, you know, other, uh, other cells to migrate in like uh, fibroblasts, for example. Fibroblasts will migrate in and produce fibrinogen. Fibrinogen gets converted to fibrin. Fibrin then clogs up the blood vessels, the capillaries, so that you can't get enough oxygen delivery into the tissues. So then the hypoxia then causes lactic acidosis, blah, blah. Wow, that was that was a complicated picture you just painted. And I, I, I have to be honest with you, I haven't learned very much about the role of fibroblasts in, in, in explant patients. So yeah. I'd like to unpack that a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, pretty much anybody that's got uh, uh, un- unwelcomed microbes inside their body is going to have some excessive production of, of fibrinogen and fibrin. And uh, you know, if if you get if you if you say a capillary has no fibrin in it, red blood cells go down through there, deliver oxygen through the wall of the capillary into the tissues, and the patient has sufficient oxygen inside the cells of the tissues to have normal metabolism. But if you have just one thin layer of fibrin all the way around the capillary, a, white, a red blood cell can go down through there and the oxygen can't diffuse across the cell membrane because there's too much fibrin blocking the, the, the diffusion of the oxygen, so the tissues become our oxygen starved. So I'm, I'm fascinated by oxygen therapies and the treatment of chronic illness, like this type of patient. I'm familiar with the mechanisms by which some pathogens produce carbon monoxide, which can compete with oxygen for RBC binding, which can exacerbate systemic oxygen issues. I wasn't familiar with that. That's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, carbon monoxide poisons the the uh, hemoglobin for uh, you know for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, you have to replace the red blood cells with new hemoglobin before you get rid of the carbon monoxide problem, or you go through a hyperbaric oxygen chamber mm-hmm. and, and push the uh, uh, carbon monoxide off of the cells. I've used methylene blue which mm-hmm. in an IV, which helped. I mean, it, all oxygen therapies seem to provide great help. It just doesn't really fix the root cause. So there's, yeah. there's many ways that th- yeah. these problems manifest. Yeah, well, one of the ways that uh, ozone therapy and uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, intravenously uh, 
work is by increasing oxygenation of the tissues. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. I can't thank you enough. It means the world to me to be here with you today. And Yeah, I, I hope that this uh, helps somebody. Yes, me too. Well, thank you very much.